This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Hey guys, it's been a while since I reviewed a film on this channel, so I thought I'd tackle a film that you've all been requesting for a long time. That's right, the 2018 film Hate Story 4, made by the most subscribed YouTuber of them all, T-Series. Now I got a lot of issues with Hate Story 4, but let's start with what I liked. What a video clip hai, aur wo... <laughs> Firstly, the acting is sensational. Someone said we just to blackmail me. Malap Zimvari did a great job on writing the uh, dialogues. The manner he switches from English to what I presume is Hindu seamlessly. I want to be the face of Senorita. Don't worry, Senorita. I say, bade bade deisho me aisi choti choti baato ki fikr nahi karte is expert. And overall, Hate Story 4 stays true to the Hate Story franchise. It's the racy and heartwarming erotic thriller we've come to expect and love from Vishal Pandara. Wait a second. Oh, I've got the wrong film. Oh, I'm so sorry, I really messed this up. It's supposed to be a Toy Story 4 review. I must have gotten confused by the titles. I'm, I'm so sorry. I love you, are you? So yeah, what did we all think of Toy Story 4? Because I felt it went over like soft jam. Everyone was excited about it. Not as excited as Toy Story 3, but yeah, we all went to see it. Gave Disney buckets of money, handfuls of the stuff. And for the most part, people came out pretty happy. You might have cried a bit when Woody left. Duck and Bunny were funny. Forky was goofy. But this might just be me. I might be alone in saying this. But Toy Story 4 felt dissatisfying. And since I am considered the foremost voice on Disney films by the BBC. Uh, we're joined now by the co host of Film Review YouTube channel Nitpicks. Great name, that's Sam Jones and Max Barsley. Thanks very much for joining yeah, us. Thank you for having Thanks. us. Um, Max, what do you think of this then, this idea of remaking classics? You know, I feel like they're taking advantage of my, my childhood and they're, you know, ruining my childhood. Um, that's what I think is most interesting about it, yeah. Um, I don't think you can make the lions dance. Um, yeah. Max and Sam, thank you very much for coming in to chat with us. We appreciate it. I felt it was worth analysing whether this sense of emptiness within me was the result of a disappointing sequel or if my breakup with Caroline was just getting to me. And what I found out was that it was definitely the film's fault. But first, I've got a secret to tell you. Yeah, come closer. Surfshark VPN. Are you staying in a hotel and scared of being hacked by people using the same Wi-Fi as you? Surfshark VPN. Are you in a strange, unknown country where you can't access your favourite streaming sites? Surfshark VPN. Are you trying to book a flight but find the ticket prices keep changing depending on what country you're in? And maybe you'd like to get the tickets as cheap as you could possibly get them? Surfshark VPN. Take your computer anywhere. Hypothetically. Get Surfshark VPN at www.surfshark.deals forward slash nitpicks. Enter promo code nitpicks for one extra month free and 83% off. 83% off! That's a lot. To be honest, you're not going to get a VPN cheaper than that. That is good value. Number one, the year was wrong. Now I think Toy Story 4 makes a basic mistake from the get-go, and that's the year of its release, 2019. Now this may seem like a petty criticism, and it is, but hear me out. The Toy Story franchise has always maintained its continuity over its sequels. In Toy Story 1, Andy is 8 years old and the toys are mostly concerned about being replaced by newer toys. Toy Story 2 is set a couple of years later and now the toys are realising that Andy's getting older with each passing day. And there will soon be a time when Andy will no longer need toys. We see Andy's younger sister Molly taking her first steps as Woody and Buzz talk about their bleak future. Are you still worried? About Andy? It'll be fun while it lasts. I'm proud of you, cowboy. Besides, when it all ends, I'll have old Buzz Lightyear to keep me company. Toy Story 3 came out 11 years later. In that time, the original Toy Story stands have grown from adorable little scamps to cynical teenagers. But the writers cleverly used the established continuity to set the film a decade or so after Toy Story 2. Andy is now about to go to college, and many of the toys from the original films have disappeared. The toys that are still around have been discarded in a trunk. We see Andy packing his things for college. He picks up Woody and Buzz and contemplates which toy to bring with him. This is essentially the entire 
entire conflict of the first film. But the decision is made almost emotionless, without any sentimentality, because Andy doesn't care about toys anymore. It's time to get a job. The toys end up in a new bedroom, with a new child, and some new toys. It essentially brings the trilogy to a full circle. The toys have returned to having a young child play with them, and they have returned to a safe environment where they are once again valued. The time span between these three films made the narrative grander, and it felt like the films were growing up along with you. It was a subtle and unique way to reach out to people as individuals. It's not necessarily a huge thing, but on a base level, with Toy Story 4, that unique storytelling feature has been done away with, because despite the nine year gap between 3 and 4, the 4 film seems to be set a year later at most, and with that, the film moves a little further away from having that human touch, almost as if it was made by faceless Disney suits who hunger for nothing but money. Number 2 Bo Peep's Personality Crisis Bo Peep is back for Toy Story 4 that's right, they listened to the outcries of millions of fans who all screamed out Where was Bo Peep in Toy Story 3? She was my fave! She was my absolute fave! She was sadly redacted from Toy Story 3 because unlike the other toys, she's made of porcelain, which breaks under high temperatures. She would have shattered into pieces during that final act and it probably wouldn't have been appropriate for a family friendly animated romp. So Bo Peep's in Toy Story 4 because there aren't any huge incinerators in this one. Thank God! But she seems to have had a complete personality shift. In the first two films, she's a homity sheep maiden, and now in this one, she's all action-ready hunk McGroove. So what happened? Where did this complete personality shift come from? Well, I personally think her transformation happened at the end of Toy Story 2. We see all the toys return home from their mission to their women-in-waiting. All the toys are celebrating, but Bo Peep seems stiff. It's clear that even with Woody's arm around her, something fell off. It was a few weeks later when Buzz told Bo the whole truth about what happened at Al's toy barn. Woody almost left for good. He almost went to Japan to be in a museum. Had he ever thought about Bo? Considered her in this momentous decision? Of course not. She was just a homity sheep woman who'd wait for him no matter what. She wasn't decisive. She wasn't assertive. She wasn't athletic. In Toy Story 1, when Woody was crying out for help from Sid's room, she didn't run to his rescue. She stayed in the back and prayed for the best. Then in Toy Story 2, she wasn't part of the rescue team. She's made of porcelain. She's modeled off an old fashioned sheep maiden. That's her character. And it was after reflecting on all these aspects of her personality and after analyzing every facet of her identity that Bo Peep thought to herself My character is not economically viable for a 2019 audience so she changed it. She changed everything. Where she was once porcelain, she is now a much higher strength porcelain. Where she was once meek and mild, she is now confident and assertive. Inactivity has turned to activity, and a dress has turned into a jumpsuit. Now, I don't really care, because the character has always been crap, but there is way more of Bo Peep in this film than any other one, and she's for sure my least favorite character in this whole blimmin' franchise. <laughs> Even with a new 2019 personality, she's just not particularly funny, or interesting. She plays more of an aggressive voice of reason, dragging Woody around from set piece to set piece. I'm not really sure what her motivation or goals are throughout the film. She doesn't introduce conflict to the narrative, and the only real decision she makes is going back for Woody in this scene right here. Get in! Oh. We're going back. We just got here. You heard Bo? We're going back! Move your plush! Let's ride! But this scene is essentially pointless, because by the time she does get back to him, he's already had his voice box forcibly trapped transplanted and there's nothing to save him from. Weak for a Toy Story film, but pretty inoffensive and standard for an animated kids film. So none of this bothers me. But what does irk me about Bo Peep is that Disney flippin' gaslighted me. Bo Peep's character change is strange to me mostly because the writers pretend that there isn't a character change at all. They tell us that Bo Peep has always been this way and that we're just remembering it wrong. Toy Story 4 opens with a flashback to sometime between the events of Toy Story 2 and 3. In this scene, Bo Peep and Woody work together to save RC. This scene depicts Bo Peep as a calm, calculating strategist, ordering the other toys in Molly's room around like she's a general or something. Woody and Bo Peep turn to each other and say this. Operation Pull Toy. Wow, 
They have so much trademark chemistry. They both knew to do Operation Pull Toy at the same time. What I don't get is why they didn't introduce her in this flashback as the original character we know and love, and then have that character change happen sometime off screen. Because it makes sense for her to change into a proactive, decisive, and action ready character when she's been living this nomadic, thrill seeking, lost toy life for years. Imagine if the film opened with a scared and timid Bo Peep on the verge of tears being boxed up and taken away from the other toys. Then, when Woody does reunite with her years later, he would have been all freaked out because she's changed so much. She's independent for the first time in her life, and this time she doesn't need Woody's approval. I think that would have added some meat to this soft jam of a film. It would have been relatable because we've all had exes that changed over time, and we've all felt a little worthless when we see how much they've moved on without us, but maybe I'm just thinking about Caroline too much, and I'd rather the film mirrored my own life instead of mirroring whatever the hell this is. But this flashback just goes to show that Bo Peep's personality change isn't something that's been informed by the world of the film at all, but is simply just a lazy way to capitalize on a character that could potentially quell our insatiable craving for nostalgia juice. Number three, why is Woody weak? Woody is somehow a more trash character than Bo Peep in this film, to be fair. Whereas before Woody felt like a slightly neurotic, but considerate boss, now he feels like a senile old man who's always talking about his dead best friend. Which means you are going to be there for Andy when he- Who's Andy? Only a year has passed at most between Toy Story 3 and 4, yet for some reason Bonnie has gone from loving Woody to leaving him in the closet in less than a year after Andy put special emphasis on how important he was. It seemed like Bonnie was really excited about Woody in the last film, especially since she like found him in a tree and brought him back and then she snatched him off Andy at the end. But I guess that's just five year olds for you. You can't trust the brats, not even for a blimmin instant. You think you can take care of him for me? Get a lie. So yeah, Bonnie doesn't really care or seem to really notice Woody anymore. After all the work and effort he put in to find a new home, he's wound up in the same place he was at the start of the third one. But Woody isn't even phased by this, whereas before, something like Bonnie giving Jesse his sheriff badge would have really bothered him. He's just so old and tired now. Dolly has taken charge of Bonnie's room, doing all the announcements and making all the decisions. Do I need to be worried? No, no, my guys are veterans. They'll hang in there. Good, just keep them calm until we get word. Yes, ma'am. Essentially doing Woody's old job. I always thought Woody did this in the first one because he was Andy's favourite toy. It kind of made sense. But yeah, I don't know if Woody just gave her that job, or if the toys have an election. Yeah, I, I don't know. While at school, Bonnie puts some googly eyes on a plastic spork and calls it Forky. It's now her favourite toy and she loves it. And it's alive! Anytime Forky is missing, she starts crying and frantically searching for her homemade spork toy. Forky? Where are you? Forky? Where's Forky? <laughs> Mom! Dad! What's wrong, man? Are you okay? I can't find Forky! He's missing! Oh, bit weird, but okay. Woody sees it as his obligation, his mission, his duty to prevent Forky from killing himself. Because if she loses him or if she wakes up and he's not there by her side, she'll explode or somehow not be able to deal with school. This situation is made more tenuous when Bonnie's family decide to go on a road trip. Because that's what American families do apparently. Woody spends the whole trip trying to stop Forky from running away while all the other toys just watch because I guess Woody is the only toy that really cares about this. One night, Woody keeps watch on Forky, but he's struggling to stay awake. This is the first time they've ever shown toys sleeping, because why would they need to? They don't have organs or brains, so why would they go to sleep? In Toy Story 1, while Sid is sleeping, Woody and Buzz are wide awake, and then in Toy Story 3, when Buzz is reset, he spends all night watching the toys without sleep. Anyway, Buzz sees that Woody is struggling and offers to take over his shift to let Woody get some toy sleep, but Woody declares declines the offer, saying that this is something he needs to do alone. Want me to take the next watch? I'll keep an eye on Forky. No, no, I need to do this. That little voice inside me would never leave me alone if I gave up. While they're talking, Forky jumps out the window, and Woody rushes after him, even though a few minutes ago he was barely able to stay awake. Woody doesn't go back to sleep for the entire rest of the film, so I guess the toys only need sleep when it's convenient for the plot. Anyway, why did Woody decline Buzz's help? Why does he need to look after Forky on his own? Well, it's later revealed that Woody is obsessing over Forky because it's the only thing he has left to do. It's the only thing left that gives him value. Because it's all I have left to do. I don't have anything else. 
Throughout the whole film, Woody is constantly repeating the same thing over and over, that he needs to get Forky back to Bonnie. There is never a moment when that changes. It's just that single character motivation that's weakly holding the whole film flimsily together. Her other toy is trapped in this antique store. I have to get that toy from Gabby. Bonnie needs him to get through kindergarten. Just leave me Forky. Bonnie needs him. But that's fine, because this is a film for tiny, tiny babies, and to expect anything more of this film would be unfair. Right? Well, it might shock you to hear that Woody's character in the original Toy Story film, a film that came out 24 years ago, went through character arcs and had motivations that dynamically shifted from scene to scene. He starts off as Andy's favourite toy, he's like the big man on campus, he's got respect, you know what I mean. And then Buzz comes in, and Woody's filled with bitterness, jealousy and rage. There's conflict, and that builds up to Woody attempting to murder Buzz. Then later on, Woody's conflict shifts to Sid, it becomes a survival horror film with Woody trying to make it back to the warmth and comfort of Andy's room. Woody and Buzz now share the same conflict, Sid, so they naturally become allies and return to Andy's room with a sincere and genuine friendship that is earned. The issue with Toy Story 4 is that the main conflict is always centred around Forky, and as the other toys don't really care about Forky, and as Bonnie has already shown signs of being a fickle psychopath, picking up and dropping toys at a whim, it has the weakest stakes compared to the previous three films. Furthermore, Woody doesn't come up with the plan to rescue Forky, Bo Peep does. He's never in a place of conflict or stress, as all the environments, even the antique shop, are inoffensive and welcoming to Woody. He never really does anything stand out or exceptional to make us like him or root for him. And that's a shame, considering it's the guy's last film in the franchise. Yeah, that's right. Woody leaves at the end of this film. Just like Caroline left me. So let's talk about that. Number four. Woody voted leave. There's no doubt over here in my corner that Woody leaving wasn't a touching scene. How could you not cry? It's Woody! Ah, oh, Woody! And he's leaving! Forever! But the question I'm asking is, why is Toy Story 4 touching us? Is it because the film has taken us on a journey and this is our well-earned catharsis? Or is it because this is a character that's had three films for us to get attached to? My argument is that it's the latter, because within the context of Toy Story 4, Woody's decision to leave Bonnie and be a lost toy doesn't add up to me. I've been crunching the numbers and I don't really get it. I mean, maybe you can help me out here, because in the first two Toy Story films, it's constantly asserted that life is only worth living if you're being loved by a kid. Somewhere in that pad of stuffing is a toy who taught me that life's only worth living if you're being loved by a kid. The relationship the toys have with Andy is one of unconditional love, and that's any kind of love. You can interpret it as a romantic love, religious love, or even parental love. The relationship toys have with their kids is a special and intimate one. Being played with is the only way that their kids can directly express that love, which is why these toys are so obsessed with being played with. It's everything to them. Even at Sunnyside Daycare, the kids that play with them form strong bonds with the toys. Lotso says that they stay with the kids until they grow up, and then they get new ones. When the kids get old, new ones come in. When they get yeah, old, yeah, I, ju I just said things. this. But in Toy Story 4, we're introduced to a whole new way of life for a toy, and that's being a lost toy. Lost toys don't have a special or intimate relationship with a kid, they're kidless, and move from place to place. This is how Bo Peep and her friends Giggle McDimples live. Oh, and, and her sheep, who now have names for some reason. I wonder why. 20 quid? Sold out? Who's buying this rubbish? This way of life contradicts with every single thing Woody has said, done, and believed for the last 20 years. Woody thinks that being played with and loved by a kid is the only thing that matters to a toy, whereas Bo thinks toys should be free and should explore the world. They have complete different ideologies. Surely they can't both be right. You'd think this would produce some debate or argument or conflict between the two. You'd think that Woody would need to be convinced into leaving Bonnie and becoming a lost toy. But you could argue that Woody just sees Bo's lost toy lifestyle and convinces himself that it's right for him. But I'm not even sure what the life of a lost toy really entails. When we're first reunited with Bo, she and some other toys are in this park so that kids can pick them up and play with them. So I think that's what lost toys do. They look for kids and then wait for them to play with them. And that's why Bo's arm is broken off. What if a kid like Sid picks them up and takes them home? How is driving around in a skunk mobile looking for toyless kids a more exciting way of living? Why would Woody want this? He's a very insecure and anxious character 
character. It seems like these lost toys are in constant danger and stress. Okay, so, so maybe Woody didn't think it through. Maybe the real reason he leaves Bonnie is so that he can be with Bo Peep, the love of his life. But surprisingly, Bo Peep and Woody originally had better chemistry than what we see in Toy Story 4. Bo used to be quiet, soft, and sweet. This worked well with Woody's neurotic anxiety, as she could reassure him and make him feel better about himself. Oh great, that's just great. This'll be the first year I miss cowboy camp, all because of my stupid hat. Woody, look under your boot. Don't be silly, my hat is not under my boot. Would you just look? You see, no hat, just the word Andy. Uh-huh. And the boy who wrote that would take you to camp with or without your hat. I'm sorry, Bo. Woody was proactive and he was passionate. He gave Bo Peep something to get excited about. He added some much needed action in her dull and dreary life. I mean, she's clearly aroused by him. What do you say I get someone else to watch the sheep tonight? <laughs> Hell yeah. In Toy Story 4, all of that has gone. He now likes her because she's like a beefed up version of himself with all the heroism, but without the flaws. And I'm sorry, but that just feels contrived and fake. Even though they never directly show that Woody is dissatisfied with his life in Bonnie's room, I think the real reason that Woody leaves at the end is because Bonnie doesn't play with him anymore and his ego can't handle that. This shark toy in Andy's room was never played with. He was left in the trunk. But you don't see him whining about having no purpose. When Andy grew up and stopped playing with his toys, none of them even considered or thought about leaving because being there for Andy was more important. It doesn't matter how much we're played with. What matters is that we're here for Andy when he needs us. That's what we're made for, right? Woody could have gone to college with Andy, but instead he chose to stay with his friends. I guess all that stuff about sticking together through thick and thin, all those years of friendship and hardship get thrown out the window when your owner doesn't play with you enough. That and meeting a thick ass, hot ass porcelain babe is your cue to dip, according to Toy Story. All those arduous experiences and lessons that the characters went through seem to have been forgotten, and the cast has been replaced with dumber, simpler versions of what were quite multifaceted characters. Take Buzz, for example. In Toy Story 2, Buzz used his Space Academy training as a tool for detective work and to organize a rescue mission with planning and strategy. Now he's running around on his own with no clear set purpose because he thinks his voice box is his inner Consciousness. How could Buzz be aware he's a toy but still misinterpret his voice box to be his inner consciousness? At movie 4! When Woody doesn't come back with Forky, the toys weirdly turn to Buzz for advice on what to do next. Buzz, what do we do? What do we do, Buzz? Buzz, what do we do? What do we do, Buzz? What do we do, Buzz? Buzz, Buzz. But they've already established that Dolly is the new leader of the toys, and she's right there doing nothing. So the film's even inconsistent with things that are set up in itself. These things don't bother me that much. I mean, they're only small details, but it's exemplary of my issue with Toy Story 4. It's the imagery without the substance. And I guess that's why to me, Toy Story 4 was just Meh. It looks like Toy Story. In fact, it's legit the best looking Toy Story we've had. I mean, it does look beautiful, but under the surface, the film doesn't offer a whole lot. The effectiveness of the film relies entirely on our attachment towards what we've had before. It is still effective, we still have an emotional response and we are still invested, but this response doesn't match what is achieved when time, effort and passion is put into saying something new. Either that or this is all just about Caroline. I've sent her two emails, just explaining everything I'm feeling and stuff about our relationship. The other one was about Toy Story 4 and she, she's not answered any of them. Either way, comment down below and let me know in the comments section what you think of Toy Story 4 or what I should do to get over Caroline. And while you're at it, you might as well punch that subscribe button as well and follow us on Twitter. We're almost on 5,000 followers and when we reach 5,000 followers, I'll do something mental like eat a Kit Kat. And if you already have, if you're a fan of this channel, I'm going to do a bit now where I talk for one minute and I tell you about all the stuff that's to do with this channel. Now, if you're not about that, now is your time to dip. The last video we uploaded on this channel was called The Journey of John, which was a nitpick short film and 10,000 of you will watch that. And some of you guys left comments which were really uh, sweet and I just wanted to thank everyone who has given it a watch and who did leave a comment. It's really great to feel supported on this channel. Uh, you guys 
films are sick. Thank you so much. Making films is something that me and Max are really passionate about. If you want to see some of our other films, there's a playlist on our channel. We're very excited to announce that Bangers and Mash, which is just the first two minutes of Journey of John, has been selected to show at Shorts Film Festival uh, in North London on the 3rd of November. You probably know by now, we do have a podcast as well. It's called Bleeding on the Page. Uh, we've changed it quite a lot since we first brought it out. We're now putting out weekly episodes uh, where we're talking about the Joker, uh, the Breaking Bad movie, the Netflix show Criminal. The, our last episode, we did a competition where you could win a Genie and the Boy t-shirt. It's been one year now since we released that short film. If you have bought an item of clothing from us, thank you so much. It really does mean a lot to us that you would wear something on your body <laughs> that would reflect the content we make. It's a gesture of love and we genuinely really appreciate it because you're supporting the channel and you're encouraging us um, artistically. And a lot of the t-shirt sales, a lot of that money went towards making our short film Journey of John. So thank you so much. Uh, really, I can't thank you enough. So yeah, if you if you did want to get a t-shirt, it's nip, www.nitpicks.co.uk. Thank you very much for listening to my, my diatribe. More videos coming soon. I don't know what to do next. Not sure what to review. View, so please do leave some suggestions in the comments uh, and I hope you guys have a wonderful time. Thank you for listening. Bye!